Hello, my name is Don Park, and I'm from UCLA. Today, I'll be talking about the marriage of dual portal spinal endoscopy and dual XT lift, also known as amplified dual lift. Sorry that I wasn't able to make the symposium in person and had to give this uh, talk uh, virtually. I hope that it's a great day uh, for everybody um, and, and uh, they're learning a whole lot about dual portal endoscopy. These are my disclosures. So dual portal spinal endoscopy is when you have two separate uh, portals, one for the endoscopic viewing portal and another for the working portal. And it truly decouples the endoscopic camera from the surgical instruments and differentiates it from the uniportal technique. This allows for greater flexibility, better visualization since it is uh, endoscopic, as well as uh, you know, increased versatility since you're no longer uh, just uh, uh, limited to the trajectory of the endoscopic trocar. It's a familiar approach and territory as uh, I'll talk about further. It's the same surgery with the same instruments. Uh, it's just a different visualization tool. Whether you use uh, loops or microscopic uh, uh, techniques to perform surgery and specialized retractors, you know, it's the same surgery that you're doing when you get to the anatomy. And the same goes for dual portal. And so we're just using an endoscope to visualize uh, the anatomy and to affect it. There are challenges with the endoscopic TLIF um, uh, that uh, are more due to the limitations of the uniportal technique. The transcambin uh, far lateral extraforaminal technique uh, does have limitations because uh, the, uh, you can injure the exiting nerve root. You can have quadriceps palsies, radiculitis, and that's been described in the literature. And as a question of uh, fusion, can you truly get fusion through uh, the devices available? There's limitations in the uh, cage options for the uniportal technique. Since you do need a narrow cage to fit through that approach and to fit through the transforaminal uh, 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 corridor. And uh, there are uh, reports of uh, end plate resorption that occurs with certain implants um, that could limit fusion. In my mind, the biggest limitation is unfamiliar territory. You know, I don't think that we're traditionally taught to go outside in uh, to uh, get to the disc and uh, and to do a, a T lift. So because of that, it is a steep learning curve uh, with the endoscopic T lift. The dual portal endoscopic T lift is different, and and it was developed and uh, advanced in South Korea. Dr. Ha and Dr. Park, who are faculty there today, are uh, some of the innovators and masters in this technique, and they taught me everything that I know about uh, the endoscopic telos uh, using the dual portal technique. They showed me large peak cages being placed uh, uh, posterior laterally. These were like uh, like lateral cages that they were putting in a telos uh, into the disc space and rotating into position, and that just blew my mind in terms of what you can do with this technique. It's more familiar. You know, you, you're seeing the, the anatomy just like you would, uh, and the steps are, are similar to MIST lift. Then with expandable devices, there are challenges as well. You know, there's a risk of subsidence that's uh, documented in the literature. It's difficult to revise or re reposition certain implants. It can collapse postoperatively, which, uh, uh, which has been seen in the past. And there's minimal volume in terms of uh, bone graft that can be placed after expansion with certain implants. And the subsidence and collapse is something that's been well documented in the literature. And so this is something that is concerning. Uh, and the dual X design is really to help reduce that risk of subsidence and collapse. You have a really wide expansion and large footprint of the cage that helps minimize its subsidence. It's easy to reverse and reposition, and you can place a lot of bone graft through that cage through the open architecture of the cage. And with two independent locking mechanisms, you can have good stability um, that you can count on so it doesn't collapse again uh, after surgery. So you have uh, a, an implant that goes in a collapsed smaller state of 12 millimeters width that can expand all the way to 21 millimeters and then in, in, and expand in height by three millimeters. And it's the only implant that allows that bidirectional uh, 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 expansion that is titanium. And this is something that uh, uh, is uh, truly a differentiator uh, in the market. Uh, 
And when I first saw this cage, I, I uh, was certain this was something that can be done endoscopically, given uh, that it's placed small. And you can see that uh, uh, it has such a, a large uh, expansion that occurs. The uh, stability is occurring through a dual locking mechanism. There's a uh, expansion locking mechanism and an active secondary screw lockout. And this ensures that the cage is uh, completely expanded and stays that way. Um, it's only one of two non-screw based expansion mechanisms uh, with the uh, first expansion locking mechanism. And in terms of placing bone graft, you can place a lot of bone graft through the open architecture of the cage um, after expansion. And you can fill that, that disk space and go beyond the, uh, the contours of the cage itself. <clears throat> And truly it is market uh, uh, leading and differentiating as compared to the other expandable uh, cages out there on the market. The uh, elegance of this uh, uh, implant is the inserter. The inserter is truly uh, a marvel in that it is something that you can just uh, 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 pick up right away because it's so easy. The inserter can help you with insertion and placement of the cage. You, you turn the inserter uh, clockwise to laterally expand the cage and keep turning it to uh, get the vertical expansion. And then once you have uh, complete the expansion, then you can use the inserter to uh, place bone graft into the cage as well as placing the, the final uh, locking screw. In terms of clinical benefits and safety, this it's uh, uh, pretty low. Uh, complication rate with only two adverse events reported to the FDA and less than a 0.2% adverse event rate, which is quite low compared to what's expected by the FDA for new technologies. And this is with 1600 plus levels treated. And we are undergoing clinical studies at, the time, at this time uh, to prove its clinical effectiveness and safety. And so this is uh, some cases that I have. Uh, so a case of L45 uh, grade one spondylolisthesis with uh, uh, instability with flexion and extension. And you can see severe stenosis uh, at the L45 level. So this is a pretty straightforward common uh, case that you see uh, in clinic every day. And so uh, we start with the unilateral laminotomy, bilateral decompression that you should uh, learn today at the symposium. And then you do the facetectomy, and you can see the osteotome uh, uh, performing the facetectomy. I can visualize that, that, that osteotome using the endoscope and see that I'm safe and I'm not going to be injuring the dura uh, with that osteotome. Then you expose Camden's triangle, you place the cage. It's really the same steps as an MIS TLF, but I'm just using the endoscope to visualize. And the thing that really uh, differentiates this technique uh, versus all uh, other T-lift techniques, MIS or open, is being able to place that camera into the disc space and then placing instruments to then uh, help perform the discectomy. And you can see here that I'm, I'm removing the disc material and I can have bony uh, bleeding uh, uh, end plates after removing the cartilage. What I usually do is I place a shaver and I'll sequentially shave the disc uh, space um, and then use pituitaries and curettes uh, to then remove the disc just like I would with an MIS TLIP. And then I'll place the, the endoscope into the disc space and I realize, wow, there's so much more that needs to come out. I'm not doing a good job. And there's studies that de definitely demonstrate that we're really not good at doing a discectomy on, with a TLIP. But this allows us to be, visualize you know, the, uh, the, the complete discectomy as well as preparation of plates. And this allows for successful fusion. It's not just the cage, it's not just the bone graft, but it's the technique itself that allows us to then uh, be able to get solid fusion. And I think putting that all together only optimizes our chances. And so uh, this is a video of me uh, visualizing the discectomy, taking lots of pictures and videos so I can show it to you today. And then I'm placing the cage. Uh, you can see that I have the, the door uh, retracted and I have specialized sled retractors to help in place the, uh, the cage into position. And I'll impact it into position. My uh, resident is uh, holding the endoscope and uh, helping me to maintain that visualization so I don't injure the dura. And this is the uh, uh, intraoperative uh, video of the cage going in. You can see the sled and that helps protect uh, the exiting nerve root, and then the nerve root retractor is helping to protect the uh, fecal sac. And then uh, the, uh, uh, the sled also helps to then insert the uh, cage in easily. 
And then once you get the cage into final position, then you expand and then literally you're just rotating the, uh, the uh, expander hop clockwise to get it to uh, get its final uh, medial to lateral expansion. And then you continue clockwise uh, rotation to get the vertical expansion. So really it's uh, uh, quite a simple, elegant design. And then you uh, use the same inserter to then uh, uh, find your trajectory of the locking screw and then place your final locking screw for uh, uh, the uh, final locking uh, mechanism. And I, again, I'm doing this under direct visualization with the endoscope um, and uh, uh, being able to visualize everything clearly. And here I'm placing the allograft so I can see the dura, I can see the cage in its final position after expansion, after removal of the inserter. And you can either use the inserter or the specialized uh, cannulas. I can then uh, place uh, bone graft. What I like to use is DBM fiber, and then I can place the fiber uh, into the disc space through the cage and be able to then uh, fill up the uh, uh, disc space. I also take the uh, the bone from the facetectomy and 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 I'll uh, process it uh, and use it as autograft and place it into the disc space prior to the uh, the cage placement. And then I'll place the DBM fiber uh, uh, after that. So here's a fluoroscopic image with the uh, initial uh, dual portal uh, placements. And then after the laminotomy, bilateral decompression, then uh, and facetectomy uh, with uh, the discectomy already performed, I am then placing the cage into position. I then place the cage into uh, the ventral aspect of the disc space. And then uh, once I've making, made sure that I'm across the midline, then I'll expand medial to laterally. And you can see here this final expansion where you have both medial to lateral and vertical expansion in its final position. And it's directly uh, uh, in the disk space with excellent reconstruction in that disk space in terms of height uh, and then also in terms of lordosis. And this is the final construct. And you can see that uh, 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 this patient had osteopenia. So I used fenestrated screws and cement augmentation to optimize the fixation. Um, and uh, uh, the final construct and result is excellent as compared to the preoperative state. This is another case of mine where it was a very collapsed L45 grade one spondylolisthesis uh, with severe stenosis and a lot of foraminal stenosis. And what I did here because of the significant collapse is I placed a, a pedicle screw uh, retractor on the contralateral side and then did my dual portal uh, uh, laminotomy, bilateral decompression, then facetectomy. Then I then uh, uh, accessed the disc space. I used sequential dilators and then held that distraction with the pedicle screw uh, retractor. And so that way I can maintain distraction uh, and, and be able to place the uh, cage and then uh, place the cage into its final position using the endoscope. And then uh, and this is the final construct and you can see a pretty significant height restoration uh, and restoration of the lordosis. This is my final case, and it's a recent case of mine. And uh, I uh, uh, performed uh, uh, a two-level uh, uh, fusion. And I, uh, you can see the L45 uh, grade almost two uh, uh, spondylolisthesis that is unstable. And there is a slight uh, spondylolisthesis at L34 as well with flexion <clears throat> that reduces with uh, extension a bit. And I was worried that uh, this would then get worse and I wanted to treat the L34 level as well. Here's the MRI. You can see that there's uh, mild to moderate stenosis at L34 that I wanted to then treat uh, indirect decompression. Uh, and But uh, the L45 level treat that with direct decompression since it is pretty severe uh, stenosis. And then uh, you can, uh, so here's an intraoperative image. Uh, I performed a prone lateral uh, at the L34 level. Um, and uh, the, the patient was a single position in the prone position the entire time. And that way I can then perform my uh, dual portal uh, laminotomy, bilateral decompression, and then uh, do the T lift and place the cage into uh, uh, a, a optimal position using the endoscopic technique. And then this is the final uh, uh, construct using uh, percutaneous pedicle screws. And I was able to then successfully treat L34 and L45 through very minimally invasive techniques. So this is a uh, study uh, looking at dual lift, um, comparing it to open PLIF uh, with one year follow-up. 
And the surgical time was found to be longer with dual lip as compared to open, but there were more uh, transfusions reflecting more blood loss in the open as compared to none in the dual lip. There were no difference in complication or fusion rates. And both groups did significant improvement uh, at one year as compared to pre-op. Uh, with the dual portal technique, however, there was less back pain uh, early at one week um, and better improvement of disability outcomes overall with dual portal technique as compared to open, which makes sense because of the uh, uh, open technique. But that's open and PLIF. What about with MIST lift? So let's compare apples and apples here. And so MIST lift versus dual lift with at least one year follow-up, we found that the VAS scores and ODI scores were significantly improved after surgery in both groups. And the, the VAS uh, back and SF36 at one month post-op was significantly improved more so in the dual lift as compared to MIST lift. There's no difference in terms of VAS, ODI, SF36 between the groups at six months and at one year. And there was no difference in terms of fusion rates, segmental height, and lordosis. So this means that this is uh, uh, equivalent in terms of radiographic results as well as clinical results with some improvement early on. And there's no difference in postoperative uh, complications. So this is safe and effective. And one of the authors, Dr. Ha, uh, was one of the, the uh, innovators in this technique, and he can tell you more about uh, the development of the technique, um, as well as the uh, long-term clinical results. Dr. Ha also did a meta-analysis of endoscopic fusion and found that uh, there was significant improvement in pain and disability outcomes. The hospital stay was shorter with endoscopic fusion as compared to MIS, and the complication rates were low, 1% to 5% with dual lift and the fusion rates were high, up to 95%, depending on how you look at it. And so uh, dual lift is a completely endoscopic T-lift that does not compromise decompression for stenosis. And even for pinpoint severe, severe stenosis, you can still uh, take care of that through the interlaminar approach using the dual portal technique. But once you've done that, then you then take it to the next level, take the facets off, find uh, uh, the disc space, the annulus, then prepare the disc, and then you can then uh, 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 place the uh, a cage with a large footprint um, that, with the dual X uh, cage, and then uh, uh, perform fusion. And I think that by completely removing the disc and the disc space using endoscopic uh, visualization, um, and uh, verifying that you have bleeding bone uh, within the end plates that you're going to optimize your chances of fusion. Again, it's not just the cage, it's not just the bone graft, but it's the, all of the above. It's the technique as well. So this is a game-changing technology match with game-changing technique. And now I perform dual lift uh, uh, routinely uh, for my T-lifts instead of uh, MIS T-lift. And I prefer it tremendously because of the uh, uh, advantages that I can have uh, with this uh, technology and technique. Thank you very much.